Welcome to the Palestine Church audio podcast. We hope you enjoy this message from Pastor Daniel Hennessy. For more great content and updates from Palestine Church, please visit us at palestinechurch.com. Well, what I want to start with this morning is just talking about uh, your identity and kind of speaking to you. First thing I want to say is that you're not a mistake, that you're not just some intelligent ape that by a bunch of molecules and all these things that happened to blow up and there was this huge explosion, then all of a sudden you just happened and you're just here by mistake. But God actually has a calling on you. Did you know that there are things about you that God has placed there that I can only see through you? And there are things about God that I can only see through you. And what I mean by that is just thinking about how vast God is and how massive he is And you have a -a one-of-a-kind testimony that the church needs, that you have something that you've been through. And I was just thinking about uh, Ruth, my wife, just her growing up and the things that she's been through inside of her life. She could choose to hold these things inside, and she could choose to rob the body of Christ of her testimony. Or she could choose to say, hey, this is what God has brought me through, and then I'm able, like a diamond, to see a new facet of God's face and His goodness and His faithfulness. I think of Jonathan and Sophie pastors here at the church that even before they came on and we even met them, that God took them through this incredible journey inside of their lives. And I've said this before, if you haven't talked with Jonathan and Sophie and, and heard the things that God has brought them through about his goodness and how much he provides and his faithfulness. I'm able to see a new side of God as Jehovah Jireh that I wasn't able to see before because of their testimony and the things that they bring. This got me thinking about uh, Growth Track. Uh, we just announced it just a little bit ago that we're going to be offering the Growth Track classes. Um, we have 101, 201, and all these will talk about our values and our, our core and talks about the things that we stand on, the history of the church. But then we get to discovery, which I love teaching because in discovery uh, 301, we actually get to learn more about your spiritual gifts and your uh, personalities and things like that. And what we do sometimes is that we think that if we don't have a certain gifting, that we're not valued by God. And we think that if I can't do a, a certain thing, then I, there's no way that I can participate. And we feel like almost as if there's all this pressure and we have to earn God's love. That if I don't have gifting X, Y, Z, or if I don't have a testimony X, Y, Z, then it disqualifies me and I, I have to like work harder to earn God's love. And the same thing with shame. I put this in here, it just that shame has a voice and shame will come and speak to you And what he loves to do is he loves to tell you, other than conviction, he loves to tell you that you're a failure. And he loves to come in and say, okay, you shouldn't have looked at that. You shouldn't have done this. And you know what? Because of that, you're not a son of God. You're not a daughter of God. That's not how they behave. And therefore, you're a failure. And it loves to come and attack our identity. I love what Abigail said a couple weeks ago at the um, Breath of Heaven conference here when she was talking about the prodigal son coming back. And the prodigal son came back to his father, if you remember the story, and he's coming up with every excuse, and he's coming up with every possible answer and solution that he can give to come back into his father's house. And what does the father do? It's almost as as if he was like ignoring what his son was saying, because he knew what his son, what, what was coming out of his mouth didn't sound like his son. He knew that the words that he was saying, that I can just come in and be like a servant, and I can do all these things to earn your love back, and the Father is saying, no, uh, bring the community here, and we're going to put a robe on you and put a ring on your finger, and I'm going to restore you and do all these things, and, and I don't want to hear what you're not speaking about when it, when it doesn't sound like kingdom, when it doesn't sound like my voice. <laughs> I put a story in here. Y'all want to hear a story? <laughs> Halloween uh, this past year at uh, Northside Elementary. I'm already giggling because this is hilarious. Uh, William was supposed to dress up for uh, Halloween, and we normally don't do the Halloween thing, but I was like, all right, get in the car. We're going to go up to Walmart, and uh, I'm going to pick you out a costume, right? And so I have like 10 bucks. And so as we get up there, we see this like $50 section. It's like a Hulk and a Power Ranger and all these really cool things. And I'm like, dude, I'm not about to spend 50 bucks on a costume. So let's go to the $10 section. And we go over there and it's like princess outfits and all this other stuff. And I was like, Will, you're about to let it go. You're about to be Elsa at Northside. (laughs) 
that blonde hair. I know you have blonde hair for a reason. So anyway, we, uh, I'm not exaggerating. We get to the very last costume part, which is like five, seven bucks, somewhere in there. And I'm like, this is, this is what we need right here. And uh, there's a lion outfit. There's like a mane and a pair of paws and like a tail that you're supposed to clip on or put somewhere. I don't know how you do it. Didn't really want to know. So anyway, you get this lion outfit on. And uh, as soon as we got to the car, he started putting all these things on, right? And it was like something transformed inside of my son's face. You could see it in his whole demeanor. I mean, he started growling in the car. He jumped out at the house and he went and punched his sister. Like, I'm like, what is going on here? All right. And so like my son literally just like transformed himself. But I want to ask you this morning, and I I really do want a response. Did William, was he ever a lion? Yes or no? No. He was never a lion ever. And you're thinking, okay, well, Daniel, he growled, right? He, he sounded like a lion. Well, yeah, but you know what? The more that he's in relationship with his father, the more that he grows up, the more that he's going to start to talk like me and sound like me, right? It doesn't matter how much he growls. It doesn't matter how much William stinks sometimes. William Wyatt Hennessy is my son, and he's always going to be my son. It doesn't matter what he puts on, what he tries to sound like, he's my son. There's an awesome quote, uh, Bill Johnson. I put it in here, and I'm probably going to butcher it because it, I'll get the context right. He said, I can't afford to think other thoughts than what my father thinks about me. I can't afford to think other thoughts than what he thinks about me. And that's so true because when you start thinking other thoughts, than what God's thinking about you, you start to distance yourself from him. There's something I heard uh, growing up uh, from my dad, but I told him that I probably got the the process down wrong, so I'm going to switch it up a little bit. It's from uh, belief therapy, and I called him last week, and I said, hey, do I have this right? He said, no, and I said, well, I'm going to preach it anyway, and I'm going to go for it. But uh, I want you to remember this. A thought triggers a belief that triggers an emotion that triggers an action. And what I mean by that is that sometimes we'll have a thought that God doesn't love me. The enemy will come into your thoughts and he'll tell you you're less than, that you're not valuable, that he doesn't care about you. And you'll have this thought and then it triggers a belief inside of you and you say, you know what? I really believe that he doesn't care about me. I believe that I, because I screwed up and did this, that I'm not able to come inside of his presence and I'm not able to approach him of who he is. And this causes an emotion. The emotion is, wow, I'm sad or I'm, I'm angry with God or I feel like I have to uh, have this servicey relationship with him. And then it causes the action. And the action, of course, is always separating yourself from your father's love and trying to retreat out of his presence rather than coming in boldly to his presence. The reason that this is so important, attacking your thoughts and taking your thoughts captive and making sure that you think like what Jesus thinks about you is because one of our passions, Ruth and I absolutely love marriages and we love families here in the city and in this region. And I I love what a healthy family unit will do um, in the city because it reflects the nature of our God. It reflects his character of who he is in that perfect relationship. And and what I hate seeing is when marriages are falling apart or families are falling apart because what it does is it starts to cause a distance. And, And I feel that we can't afford to think any differently than what he thinks about us anymore. We have to change our thought process. What I want to do, uh, go into Matthew. If you want to turn to Matthew 13, if you're already there, let's go to verse 44. Verse 44 says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, everybody say joy, for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And then verse 45, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl, everybody say one pearl, One pearl of great price went and sold all, all that he had, and he bought it. Now, there's two stories here, but they have the the same context. 
Uh, but the second parable goes a little bit further, and it talks about a pearl. And we're going to come back to that here in just a minute. But the way that I always read this story is that when Jesus is talking here, I thought that the pearl and the treasure was like salvation and that it was the kingdom and it was him. And I thought that I was the merchant and I had to sell everything that I had and give everything that I have in order to obtain the kingdom and obtain salvation and obtain his love. And if I can give just enough and be just good enough, then I can have who he is. And you see, when we look at it the real way, then we see that we had nothing that we were actually bankrupt, and that we are, are the treasure and the pearl, and Jesus is the one who is the merchant man who comes, and he sees us as a priceless pearl, a bride for himself, and he comes in and purchases us. And see, when we see ourselves as the, the treasure and the pearl, as a priceless possession, that's what changes everything. You see, sometimes we'll take our perspective when we think that God doesn't see me as valuable, And that he's looking for any loophole to get rid of us. He's looking for any way to get us out of the kingdom when really he's looking for any way to get us in. He's done everything that he can to get us into the kingdom. And what we do is we take that shame that we're just talking about and we wear it almost like clothes that we'll put on. And we feel that we have to wear this this shame around and we have to act a certain way. And what we do and tend to do sometimes is that we will agree more with the voice of shame than we do with the voice of the Creator, the one who made us and did everything inside of us. We would rather partner in faith and use the the authority that's given inside of our mouths to speak curses rather than blessing and actually say that we're not valuable. I'll put a side note in here, and I think I know what it's for now. The reason I mean a side note, because I had all my lesson down, but I feel like God had a word, and so I jotted this down, and I feel like... I'm going to release it this morning. Um, I'm just going to throw it out there. A guitar can't cut down a tree, but it can play music for a lumberjack. All right? That's weird. All right? Y'all love me, though, right? (laughs) You might be a guitar, and you might be thinking that you're less than and that you're not valuable and that God has no purpose for you, but it's because God's wanting to use you in something different than what you've thought. And that God has something special for you, something that he's going to use you in. And you've been beating your head against a tree thinking that this is my purpose. And God is saying, no, something completely different. This is what I have for you this morning. Wow. Well, there you go. That's a side note. Thank you, God. All right. What I want to speak about is his treasure. We see here in uh, the previous verses, then it goes into verse 45 and 46, um, talking about the pearl. And the reason I want to talk about this this morning and the reason that it's so significant is because there's a difference between the two. The treasure is something that can't be worn, but the pearl is actually for adorning yourself with, is actually for putting on. And what's neat about the pearl, it's not like a, I put a, in my notes, I was trying to give an example, and I thought it's, it's not a Lord of the Rings kind of thing where you're like Smeagol and you're petting this thing, you're like, my precious kind of thing. But it's actually a pearl is supposed to be close and personal. It's supposed to be adorned on the person. And what's neat about us as his church, as his bride, we're supposed to be adorned on his person, who Jesus is, and we're supposed to be reflecting the glory of his character as pearls. And, man, we're about to go for a bumpy ride. We're going to go in Daniel's thoughts again. Y'all ready? All right. As I'm, I'm putting these notes together, I thought about something. God, what are you saying through these verses here, and why would you go from a treasure, and then the very next verse, you're saying you're the merchant man, and you talk about a pearl. You see, the treasure and the pearl are the same thing. It's talking about us as the body, right? But what I think is that there's a different mindset here, that I feel that when you go from the mindset of a treasure to the pearl, that is the mindset of going from orphan thinking to sonship. And what do I mean by that? Is because a treasure, in my mind, I'm thinking a treasure could think I could be bought or sold with, I could be traded off. I'm valuable. I know I'm valuable, but I could be used in as like a currency kind of thing. But then when he goes a little bit further and Jesus says, but you're a pearl, a priceless pearl, I think a pearl says, I wrote these down, a pearl says I'm beautiful. 
and I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm the hands and feet in this earth to reflect my God. I don't have to work to be valuable. I am valuable. And I'm the one that is worn on Jesus. And an infinite God giving everything for that pearl, when you look at it with those eyes, this is so critical. Why? When my wife wears pearls, pearl earrings or pearl necklace or something like that, they are beautiful, and I know that they're priceless, and I'll look at that, but I look past the pearls, and I go, wow, the person that's wearing them is even more beautiful. And what we're supposed to be doing here on this earth, wearing or being as pearls on Jesus, we're supposed to be reflecting who he is, showing his love and saying, yes, I know that you like the things that you're seeing here, but it's because of the God that I serve. It's because of who he is. Access. I put this in here just because of when you go from this different mindset from a treasure to a pearl, it's not that the access changed for you to enter into his presence, but it's almost like your revelation of what is accessible in his presence. You see, I can go to Bill's house and I could say, uh, Bill, I'm really hungry for a chicken salad sandwich. And I know that Bill could give me a really good chicken salad sandwich, right? But there's difference when I go to his house and I say, Bill, I know that you have the ability to give me a chicken salad sandwich, but what I really want is one of your steaks. And you see, as a son, I could go in and say, I know what my father has that's accessible to me. I know who I am. I'm his son, and I want more than just the surfacey stuff. I actually want to go deep with my father. You understand? Am I making sense this morning? I hope I am. What happens when we honor people? and their value, and we celebrate who they are, and we start to call out their identity in Christ? What happens when we start to see what their value is, and we start to draw that out of people and say, I see exactly who you are, that you're made in his image, that you're his handiwork? Thank you, Father. The price. This is where I want to kind of wrap things up here, and then we can have some ministry. Remember that when we're talking in the beginning, what something is worth or the value that we place on something is what somebody's willing to give for whatever that thing is. And what Jesus did, the price that he was willing to pay was himself. He gave everything that he had. Second Corinthians uh, chapter 8, verse 9 says, For you have experienced the extravagant grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that although he was infinitely rich, he impoverished himself for our sake, so that by his poverty we could become rich beyond measure. Jesus sold everything for his treasure. He gave everything up that he had in order to obtain us. And I couldn't fathom this. I couldn't really come to grips with how could somebody who is eternal, somebody who is infinite, who has everything that he could ever need, decide to want me and to value me and to take me. And I started thinking back to the very beginning, and this is where we're going to jump into Genesis. If you'll turn over to Genesis 2, verse 7. What I always thought is that God, ha, huh, God went down to the uh, Hobby Lobby in the Garden of Eden, and uh, he found some clay. He found some dust in the craft section. He said, I'm going to make man. And so what he did is he, you know, molded it all together, and then he blew on it, and then there was his spirit. There we are, and here we are, man and, and woman, right? But if you look at the story and you ignore what Daniel's saying about Hobby Lobby, and you look at chapter 2, verse 7, he made us in his image, and it says in verse 7, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living thing. What's interesting about this, and it took me a while to catch on because I've read creation, I've read all these stories so many times, but when I started thinking about who I am in him, I saw something very different. You see, if you're performing CPR on an adult, you go up to the adult, you take their chin and their head and you tilt it back, you hold their nose, and you exchange your life inside of your lungs and give them life 
and you breathe in life into the adult. But there's something very different that you do for a child. See, what you do for a, an infant all the way through one year is, is that you go up to the victim, you take the child, you tilt their head back, you leave their nose open, and you take your mouth because I'm so big, because I'm so massive compared to this child that I'm giving my life into them, I cover my mouth over their nose and their mouth, and I breathe in life into their nostrils and give them breath. And when I looked at this story again, I thought, I have this massive God, this huge creator who loves me, who comes in not as a blowing breath, but as an intimate father over his son. And he covers my nose and my mouth, and he goes, and breathes life into my nostrils. And when I look at it that way, and I see that he wanted me a part of his family. You see, he's not some just distant celestial being that just wants to throw all these rules and regulations and do everything that he can to keep you back, but he's one that says, come here. You're the one that I'm, I'm covering my mouth in, in an intimate moment. I'm breathing life into your body, giving everything that I have for you. Why? Because you're my son, Daniel. I value you because you're my family. You're my son, and I give everything for you. Thank you, Father. If you would just stand with me this morning.